Welcome everyone to the Autoimmune Hour. I'm Sharon Seeler from SharonSeeler.com and of course from UnderstandingAutoimmune.com where you can find, we're closing in on 450 episodes now of the show, so I'm really excited <laughs> that when, when I first started this, I didn't know there was that many ways to explore wellness being an autoimmune, <laughs> but there is. And we have another topic that I haven't explored very much, but I know it's a big part of many people's lives, whether you have autoimmune or not. So tonight we're going to talk about chronic pain. There was this article about 50 million people plus in the U.S. alone suffer from chronic pain. And I'm like, wow, we really have to talk about that because that's a lot of people. And I just can't imagine. I know the level of pain I have varies from day to day, but I can't imagine 50 million plus people it, just in the U.S. having chronic pain. So let me introduce Dr. Afton Hassett, and she's an associate professor and director of pain and opioid research at the Department of Anesthesiology at the University of Michigan. And she's a principal investigator at the Chronic Pain and Fatigue Research Center. She's viewed as a leader in the field of chronic pain and resilience. And she gave a keynote in the 2023 Pain Consortium Symposium on the advances in pain research. I'm really excited to know what advances we have in pain research. So welcome, Dr. Hassett. Thanks for being on the show. Thank you for having me, Sharon. I'm excited to be here. This is a huge topic. I know we only have a short period of time together, so I want to hit the highlight. First, define chronic pain. I know some people might say, yeah, I always feel crummy, but I don't have chronic pain. How does the medical community define chronic pain? It's a great question because what is chronic pain? Um, defined for medical purposes and research purposes, it's pain that's lasted for three months or more. The pain can be just irritating or it can be really debilitating. It, you don't have to be totally knocked off your pins to say that you have chronic pain. We consider the latter, the really severe chronic pain, to be high-impact chronic pain. Like you were mentioning, in the recent CDC report, there are so many people with chronic pain that we're seeing new cases that are far at stripping the diagnosis of hypertension and asthma. So it really is almost like a bit of an epidemic itself. I just feel like the topic of chronic pain is a bit overwhelming for me to get my head around. So yeah. three months or more. Mm -hmm. I hear this from autoimmune people all the time. It's one day I can wake up and, oh my goodness, it's a really good day. And then the next day, not so good. What about pain that fluctuates but lasts for three months or more? Is that still considered chronic pain? That's still considered that the waxing and waning can be part of it. So my first life, I'm in the Department of Anesthesiology, and I've been there for the last 13 years at the University of Michigan. But I started in the Department of Rheumatology at Robert Wood Johnson. And so rheumatology and autoimmune disease are my first home. And so that's where I really first started studying the impact of chronic pain within autoimmune diseases. And so people will tell you, especially the autoimmune disease, some days the disease seems to be better treated and in a good space and you feel great and you don't have pain. And then the next day, it's so disappointing because the chronic pain is back. So this waxing and waiting nature can be one of the most frustrating elements of it. Now, I want to get to a very specific topic, and then we'll come back around. The audience knows I've written down rabbit holes. But I got to thinking about chronic pain and fibromyalgia, because a lot of times I feel like people almost use those words interchangeably, but not in my mind, they're not. So can we talk about how, whether you have chronic pain or fibromyalgia? Yeah. So fibromyalgia is a form of chronic pain, but what's unique about it is it's the widespreadness. So many conditions have pain that might be localized to say, in the case of rheumatoid arthritis, maybe bilaterally in the hands or osteoarthritis, it might really attack a knee or perhaps it settles on a low back. But the cardinal feature of fibromyalgia is this pain all over the body. And also a number of symptoms that tend to go along with that, including fatigue, sometimes cognitive fogginess, changes in mood, poor sleep. But that's not alone in fibromyalgia because we as researchers, what we're really starting to understand now is that fibromyalgia pain is somewhat unique, meaning that it's often not caused by something happening in the body. Like if you have inflammation in the, in the hands or a knee that has bad osteoarthritis, the pain seems to be generated by the brain. So it's a case of where the brain is either misinterpreting signals as pain 
generating pain on its own or amplifying pain that might be there to make it feel much, much worse. But what's so fascinating in the work that we're doing now is what we're understanding is that this fibromyalgia kind of brain-generated pain can be present in just about any other painful condition. And so we see about 20% of people with rheumatoid arthritis have a fibromyalgia-like pain on top of their inflammatory pain. About 40% of lupus patients have a fibromyalgia-like pain, a widespread pain on top of their lupus. And what that means for physicians is that once we've treated these autoimmune diseases with our disease-modifying agents, there might still be pain. And that doesn't mean that we need to throw more drugs at it. It means that the pain that needs to be treated is a little bit different. It's more this fibromyalgia-like brain-mediated pain. Now, I'm curious about brain-mediated pain. It still feels painful in the body, correct? How how do I, as a lucky person, (laughs) go, oh, this is my brain versus, ow, ow. (laughs) Yeah, so it's it's so interesting. I think one of my favorite examples is, I think most people have heard of the notion of phantom limb pain, where somebody has an amputation, they lose, lose, say, a leg. And what happens is they have tremendous pain, say, in that lower leg or that foot. And the lower leg of the foot are not there, but the person saying, my foot that is not there is killing me. It's because there is a map of that foot and that leg still in the brain. And the brain can say, I'm sorry, there is pain there. And that is just an example of brain-generated pain. This can be done in many conditions. It really opens up a, a path for us to think about different treatments. We need to approach brain-generated, brain-mediated pain a little bit differently than we would other types of inflammatory or say like a neuropathic pain. I'm thinking out loud here because I'm thinking of a friend who had a very serious injury to their leg and then developed something like, I can't remember the exact name, but it was like a syndrome, a chronic pain syndrome when technically they were healed and technically there shouldn't have been pain there but it's almost like phantom pain, although the limb is still there. You could be describing CRPS, which is a- That's it. That's it. Yeah, they put it down to like, it's excruciatingly painful. This happens often to people who are dancers or athletes, and they just twist an ankle in a weird way, and they set in motion the most fiery, uncomprehensible, hideous pain in that affected area. And they actually, unlike fibromyalgia, where there's not a lot of outward manifestations, many people with CRPS have a lot of swelling and redness. And it's like, what is going on here? Again, it's just, it's another way that the body and the brain manifest pain. Wow, this sounds so complex. (laughs) There are multiple ways the body is manifesting pain. And oftentimes, I was told that a lot of times pain is to help us be aware to be more cautious of whatever it is, take better care of that limb or something like that. But it sounds much more complex than just that. But but Sharon, you bring up an important point. So acute pain has a lot of survival value. We want acute pain to tell us not to do something. So for example, if you have surgery and you have an incision and it's really painful and you don't want to move, that's good. That's your body saying, you know what? Take it easy. Same thing, you, you twist an ankle or you break an arm. All of that tells you to be gentle and careful and rest and heal. What happens, so chronic pain, the reason that we talk about three months is three months is almost like a magical number where we get to where whatever it is probably should have healed. And it's no longer acute pain telling you to be careful and aware. It's something else. And so it can be a number of things. It can be. It can be like a a slipped disc and that can go longer than three months, but it also can be The brain now has learned how to generate the signal very well. There's an old neuroscience axiom that says that neurons that fire together, wire together, meaning that the more a pain signal is generated, the more the brain just gets good at generating that that signal. Can we be taught or learn to rewire it without medication? Is is there any way that, I'm just thinking off the top of my head, can look at what's wired one way, can we? Teach it to wire a different way. Oh, Sharon, you asked me the question that I love. And we are saying yes. We're getting very close to teaching people how to actually change the wiring in their brain. It's not magical. It 
is the tie that some of these mm-hmm. strategies don't work for everybody, but there is good evidence that our brain is constantly changing. We used to think when people were adults that the brain no longer made new neurons, new connections. It was just pretty much downhill. We know that's not the case now. We know that our little neurons in our brain are constantly making new connections. When we learn a language, that's new connections. When we, when we learn a new skill, say you pick up pickleball, and then over time it becomes very easy. The movements become easy because, again, your, your brain has rewired and it's picked up a new skill. It's a procedural memory. The brain has changed. So we know this to be true. And so those networks that we think are disrupted and take over more parts of the brain than in people with chronic pain can be rewired. And we can do that with the things our moms always told us about, getting good exercise, eating well, getting enough water to drink, sleeping well. Those are all healthy for basic health for our bodies and our brains. But also there is great power in the things that we do, the things that we think and our emotions and how we experience stress. If we're interested in researching that thing, that sounds more like the way I want to go instead of just drugs or pulling myself up by buying bootstraps. What kind of people, what kind of training would I look for? It's a combination of people. There's so much interest in doing this now. And it really was the impetus for me writing the book. It's like we've learned so much in neuroscience about pain and there's so much promise in what people themselves can do. And there's a lot of interest in this kind of this brain retraining and how to do this. And my book is a good place to start because it gives you that neuroscience background. And then it tells about the different skills, the things that you can do, including thoughts and emotions and behaviors that start to help you make new connections. Even walking outside, just being outside on a regular basis, exposed to the air and nature actually help our brain rewire a little bit. Our relationships, when we feel loved and comfortable in healthy relationships, again, that's another, another way that helps us rewire because what we're doing is we're starting to undo some of the stress because that's what often would drive a lot of this negative loops of these networks that way too eagerly process, process pain. And in, in my book, I, I have people try 30 different skills and strategies with the hope that each day they try one. And they hopefully throughout the, the, the chapters leading up to get the rationale for why this might be helpful. And then they try it that day. And if it seems like something that they could maybe do business with down the road, they make a note. So some of the practices are like, how do you better pace the activities you do in the day? So in the days that you feel great, you don't overdo it. There's a lot of kind of skills and how that's done. The next day, it might be about mindful breathing. Is this something that makes sense to you and that you can add into your life? Some days it's about some new hacks to do a better job sleeping so that you don't disrupt your sleep. And then there's things that get into a different realm more in the world of positive psychology, like really understanding more about where you're going in your life. Because so many people with chronic pain have such life disruption, people with autoimmune disease, that they wonder, what is my life going to be like? How how am I going to find purpose? Everything was just tilted on its ear. And some of the skills are how to get our footing again as far as the bigger pictures, our purpose in life, the things that matter to us and our relationships. And so that's the piece of it. So the more that we decrease our stress, the more that we improve our ability to cope, the more positive emotions that we can inject, because again, those are very resilience building, the more likely we are to knock back some of that really dysfunctional pain wiring. And I got so excited, everyone in the community that Dr. Hassett was here with us that I forgot to mention she is the author of the brand new book. And so let me read the title, Chronic Pain Reset, 30 Days of Activities, Practices, and Skills to Help You Thrive. And we're all about survivor to thriver here. We love these thriver stories. A couple of things came to mind. As you mentioned, walking in nature and some of the other types of things, mindfulness, breathing, it reminded me of a couple of guests we've had on that talked about uh, resetting our vagus nerve and calming down the fight, flight, or freeze effect. Does pain play a part in that fight, flight, or freeze response in an irritated vagus nerve? There are a couple problems here. So there are many people with chronic pain who have traumatic histories. And they bring that to the table, perhaps a autonomic nervous system that is more likely to spring into a fight, flight, or freeze. The pain signal itself can be interpreted by the body as a threat. So every time somebody feels pain, that's a threat. And that's a very normal 
kind of response. And so much of this kind of fight or flight or freeze response can drive the pain itself, but it also can create just an incredible state of activation where we have sympathetic nervous system activation and we do want to, to calm that down with our parasympathetic activation. And there's things that we can do to do that. So diaphragmatic breathing, breathing at about six breaths per minute can really start to knock that down. And some early research that we did actually shows that we can change kind of vagal functioning by, by impacting the varo reflex, which kind of modulates our kind of heart rate variability in our autonomic nervous system. And that's as simple as 10 minutes a day, breathing at about six, six breaths per minute. That's 10 seconds in and 10 seconds out. I think that's an important piece of it. And we know that stress plays an important role in almost all human diseases. So why wouldn't that be true in autoimmune disease and in chronic pain? Well, I found in all the interviews I've done that stress plays a huge portion in it, as well as trauma. I get upset when people say big T trauma, little T trauma to me and all of my interviews. I find that trauma is trauma. We need to take a quick commercial break. And when we come back, we're going to talk much, much more with Dr. Afton Hassett about chronic pain and understanding some of the other activities that we can do that are in her book, Chronic Pain Reset, 30 Days of Activities, Practices, and Skills to Help You Thrive. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everyone. Now, Dr. Hassett, one of the things I wanted to talk about, I know uh, as a psychologist, what part does positive psychology play? Glad you asked that. Most psychologists are trained in what we kind of call business as usual psychology, right? So we really focus on all the things that go wrong in people. And a lot can go wrong when people have chronic illness, right? So many people develop depression and anxiety, which is really important. Many people come with trauma histories, uh, many people have difficult relationships because their lives are is disrupted. And so now they're having a hard time with their spouse or other families. So there's a lot of things that go wrong. And these are really important to address and help people understand and develop skills to deal with and to get better from. And that's a key part of being a psychologist. But there's a growing appreciation of how remarkably resilient the people are that we're treating, that are sitting before us. And the appreciation is really exemplified in the study of positive psychology, which is a, a relatively new field, but is actually pretty commonly known now. And it's really where we study what goes right in life. And that's where I've been for the last 20 years is studying the difficulties and the challenges that come with having chronic pain and finding good treatments to help people, but also understanding what goes right and developing treatments to enhance that, to help people really understand more about what are their character strengths and how do they put these to work? What are their resources? How to build much more adaptive and healthy relationships? And as I was talking about a little bit before, how to rework their lives so that what was lost before the illness, what we said goodbye to and had to mourn, is replaced by something that feels maybe even more enriching and better. And so how do we re tap into that purpose in life? And how do we even get into grander things like the experience of awe and bring just incredible beauty into our lives and, and incredible richness into our friendships? I love that. I am such a proponent of all of that. When I first started with the diagnosis, and it's not typically who I am, but I really found myself in this away from type of mindset. I don't want to go there again. I don't want that. I don't know what I want, but I don't want that. So it was definitely not a forward thinking kind of way. And when I was able to get some help and change the viewpoint towards goals, and usually they were very small goals at the beginning, but just little tiny changes. <laughs> if had someone once tell me, you have excellent coping skills. Now, I don't know if that was a compliment or not, because I'd rather just not have to cope. <laughs> and have an awesome life. I don't know. I found that kind of odd about this idea of going beyond coping skills and just developing the life that you want and creating that as part of the new you. If you had asked me in 2014 if I would be doing this show for that many years, as well as 400, almost 50 episodes, I would have said, no way, no how. But one thing I did was the show, it's given me new reason. And I feel like just doing the show once every week 
has really given me opportunities to grow beyond who I was then. People often ask, wouldn't you like your old life back? In retrospect, hindsight, I'm no, not really. I'm really yeah. doing, enjoying what I'm doing now. That's so powerful. And we in science kind of study that as benefit finding, that when somebody has a devastating illness, that they go through an adventure. And on the other side of it, do they come out saying, wow, you know what? If it wasn't for that, I would not be here. And I'm pretty happy here. And it sounds like really where you're at, Sharon, that, that it's just, that was, this was not fun to go through, but wow, what I'm doing now is really valuable and probably incredibly helpful for the people that listen to your show and the other people in other ways that you, you touch people with autoimmune illnesses. I love these survivor to thriver stories and I've interviewed and they say things like, in hindsight, it was a gift. In hindsight, it changed a trajectory that they could tell was going to end in even less health than where they got off the track and started changing their life. It's fascinating to me, the ability for us to make meaning and the importance of making meaning and finding gifts in things that maybe we wish we had thought they were going to turn out differently. And it, what is that old saying? Man plans, God laughs. So we can have this trajectory for life and then just stuff happens. And the question is, are we resilient? Because so, so the word resilience really pertains to there needs to be adversity. Something bad has to happen. We don't know if we're resilient if something bad doesn't happen. And so it's just the human condition. Do we have the people in our lives and the coping skills to refocus or cope with what this thing is that, that, that's come our way? And if we actually can get to the other side of it and thrive, that's where the magic is. And, and, and that's what, what you're describing. And, and in getting there, you also stated something I love is talking about tiny goals. I think we call them like TT tags, like tiny achievable goals. And that means that you have something out there that you want to do. And it could be as simple as someday, you know, what? I want to be a therapist. I've learned a lot about my illness. I've learned a lot about me. The thing I do most comfortably is talk to other people with illnesses. And so the first step is, what's the first step? Maybe I've got to get training, but that's not the first step. The first step is open up your computer and look for programs, right? So these teeny tiny things that can be done one day at a time. I think what happens sometimes when people have chronic illnesses, they just feel like whatever it is too big. It's it's too big. It's too hard. But when we do these little teeny weeny steps every day, even on a bad day, a little teeny step. It's amazing how far forward we can move. Absolutely. Although I thought becoming a therapist sounded like a big goal. Oh, what are the, it's a huge goal, but there's 30,000 tiny steps that get you there. Right after my diagnosis, my big goal was being able to make it from the bed to the bathroom. Everybody's big goal for the moment is completely their big goal. And I want you a community to own what your big goal is, whatever it is, and have multiple ones. When I started this show, I had multiple ones. I was still quite in the exploring, surviving stage when I first started the show. And if you followed along, that it's really radically changed. And that's because doing one tiny step every day, it's not just, say, over the course of a year, it's not just 365 little steps. It compounds on each other is really important for us to reach our thriver goals and getting us where we want to go. How do you suggest people in chronic pain set those goals of where they want to go? Like the idea of becoming a therapist to me, it's a really big goal. Oh, therapist. Oh. I just threw that out there. I think it's a great goal, but to me, I was like, that was familiar. Wow. That's a big goal. <laughs> but how do you suggest people when they're feeling really crummy, have you come up with any little ideas for people to set these goals? I actually did mine in a journal, which helped me keep track of them. Journaling is one of my loves. I teach undergrads also, and I teach them all, a lot of the skills in the book, but because these skills pertain to all humans, they're not just for people with chronic pain, though there's a number of skills that are specific to chronic pain, but a lot of these aren't, and journaling is incredibly important. Yeah, it's setting these little teeny goals, being aware of what they are. And I think that we're allowed to have many goals. And I think in the early stages, maybe the early stages is just to understand. What, <laughs> and me. What are my limitations? Who are the people in my life that are going to help me or that, that I can walk through this with? It, it changes. I'm sure you can attest how your goals have probably changed over the years. 
And, oh, absolutely. My first goal just up right after, like moments after the diagnosis was learning to spell the darn word. <laughs> oh, start small, guys. Just start small. <laughs> you know, who the heck knows what a rheumatologist is until you get referred to one, right? Who are they and what are they good for? Yeah, absolutely. Now, I want to be sure and go over some of the activities. As you think about your book, The Chronic Pain Reset, 30 Days of Activities, Practices, and Skills, was there one that really stood out to you as your favorite? So I'm a big proponent of positive daily reflection and however you choose to do that. One of the things that we've learned about people who have chronic pain, actually there's a couple of things, but one of the big things we've learned is they've often lost the ability even to experience joy. And this we see as truly a brain manifestation. It's fascinating that the mechanisms within the brain, the parts of the brain that process reward in many people with chronic pain are not functioning properly. So a sunrise that would make them normally feel, oh, it's beautiful. It, it's just not sparking that. And we also know in other studies that we can retrain that part of the brain too by exposing to positive stimuli. But you have to go out there and try. And so that's why I love gratitude journaling and positive daily reflection. One of the interventions we've been studying in our lab is born from trying to help women with pain and breast cancer before their surgery have something to do that focuses on positively. My oncologist friend said, your intervention can't have a therapist. Um, you just need to give them like a couple of instructions and then you need just to leave them alone. I'm like, oh, what psychological intervention sounds like that? I thought, okay, positive daily reflection. If we can encourage them just to think about the things that happened that day despite how bad the day might have been and how scary and how off it is. But what was one thing that made them happy or made them feel grateful? And think about that one thing, reflect on it. That could help. Let's get people out of that, break that cycle of just looking at all the scary bad and think about what's one thing that kind of warmed my heart. And then I thought, okay, therapists can't be involved in this either. So we need to have something to remind them. And so we thought, you know what? Let's do a piggy bank. So I had a wonderful graduate student that was working with me, and it was really this wonderful idea of her, Sam. And we got this piggy bank, and we give people a little index card that just said, every day, think about the people, things, and events of your life that made you happy or grateful. Write it down in a piece of paper and put it in the piggy bank and do this every day leading up to your surgery. And these lovely women did this with breast cancer, this diagnosis up to their surgery, and they use their little silly piggy banks and put these ideas in there. And then the night before, we call them and say, hey, the night before surgery, open them up. And so they would open up their piggy banks the night before surgery. And then they'd see they, these 15 to 25 wonderful moments in their lives and just have this rush of happiness. And so we saw that they reported less fatigue. They put reported less pain and definitely better mood just by doing this little exercise. So we've been working on this, helping people with chronic pain do this over longer periods of time. And anybody can do this. You don't need a piggy bank. You just need a little box, put it in the, on the table. So it needs to be someplace where you see it. So you remember to do it. I've had people do it with their families. So everybody in the family throws in one little thing that was special to them that day. And what happens is people tend to then throughout their day, start looking for the thing they want to write down that night. And we start looking more readily for the positive things in our lives. And so that's really the beauty of the gratitude journal. So if you do journaling every night, sometimes we think during the day, oh, I got to make a note of that. that. I'm really grateful for that. And at the end of the day, so it's just bringing these lovely things that happen to us, to our consciousness and making them feel very real by writing them down or really owning them and feeling them at the end of the day. Oh my goodness. Where to go with that? I love the piggy bank for sure. The visual of a piggy bank with the thoughts of the, first the lightheartedness of a piggy bank and the metaphor I have around a piggy bank. Wow. What a great idea. Thank you. I have friends who ha have something similar to that and they've been incorporated down to the fact that they've got great grandkids now and they have a jar in each of their homes and they put in a success or what happened today that was a good thing. And then they combine the jars on Thanksgiving, and then each member reaches in and pulls out, and it may not be theirs. It could be any member of the families. They pull out and read what's on it. And it's just a wonderful way to remind everyone that there were a lot of good things and still are a lot of good things going on in the world. I just love that idea. 
I love that too. That is, that's a remarkable. And um, I just wanted to add one more thing that's so important that we as humans are just wired not to look for the positive as much. It's actually more of a skill. We're really mm -hmm. wired to look in our environment for what our threats are. And so if something negative happens or somebody says something that's me you know, or something bad happens, we tend to ruminate and think about that more than anything. And, and that kind of has survival value. We need to be scanning the environment for bad things to, to survive. So having a happiness practice or a positive emotion practice is really important to sharpen that other part of our brain that's less naturally inclined. Rarely happy things save us from the saber-toothed tiger, right? For sure. <laughs> Seeing the darn thing and watching for it, that will save us. I have a little science of Sharon behind that. My, so you guys, this is not, I'm not trained like Dr. Hassett, but my theory is why I remember all the negative things is because I haven't finished them yet in my mind. But if it's a success thing, oh, I'm really happy that happened or a moment of awe. Or, yes. And then somehow I just file it away really quick because check, it's complete. So that's my side of that, why I ruminate on it. And well, Sharon, I didn't really ever think about that kind of in those terms, that some of the things that bother us the most are unfinished business, and they're just yeah. kind of stuck in there. Maybe they are finished, but we're not allowing them to finish. And so we're <laughs> chewing and ruminating on it. It's very interesting. Yeah, that's my theory. So I always say, okay, how can I finish this? <laughs> I can put a check by my little, check that out. Oh, that's fantastic. One thing I wanted to mention about journaling, which I've mentioned on the show before, but it's been a while, is I love to journal. I was taught this years ago by my mentor about only on the right-hand side of the page during the time you're journaling and leave the left-hand side of the page blank. And then my mentor was very systematic. I am not. You can be systematic or not. It works either way. And go back and then reread what happened that day. Maybe he was always like weekly go back and write on the left-hand side of the page what had changed. Oh, that's interesting. It's not so systematic. I just pick a page, go read it. Like It could be six months. It could be four days. But it works either way. And I found it really helpful in understanding, especially with autoimmune and the waxing and waning, and I'm sure it's probably this way with chronic pain, with the waxing and waning, is I might read something in my journal where it was a particularly rough day. And then I can read two days ahead and realize that, okay, something changed and I could see what changed. And especially going back three months or six months and writing on that left-hand side is super helpful because I could say, wow. I am no longer there. I am way over here now. And wow. being able to see those changes is really helpful. Yeah. That, that is, again, too, so I'm so glad I came on here. I'm learning some cool things. I had not heard of that practice before, and it makes all the sense in the world. Because often when we're in the middle of it, we don't see <laughs> how we're going to get out of it. And then the more we learn, oh, yeah, I'm only here for a moment in this space. It's going to change, and the new space will be different. <laughs> But to be able to have that hindsight and go back and see how different things were, I think it, 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 that's really the resilience building. I like that a lot. I also found it helpful at times when I would think I'd always remember when XYZ happened. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't. So, so <laughs> I also found that helpful. To, okay. Yeah, really, I did have a similar thing happen to me two years ago. And what, and then I go and what did I do to get out of it? I don't know about you, but for me, sometimes things will, I'll be intervening and things will be going when I'm, then I get sloppy or I get a little lazy and then I forget what was I doing that made it go so well. <laughs> so I find writing that in the journal also helps. It's, oh yeah, that's the practice of meditating or that was the practice of finding all Okay, I need to implement that again. That, that's so great. And I, a piece of, of my book, too, is having people identify what these things are that really appeal to them. If it's finding awe and being mindful, to having them just keep them on your dashboard. Because I think you're right. I think we have these wonderful tools. We forget about them over time. We move on and life gets in the way. And maybe we don't lean on these practices that are helpful for us like we can. At least in my experience, that's too true. I, I like being able to go back and reflect, oh, yes, I need to put that up into my wellness program again, tattling on myself. I get to this point where I think, oh, I can cheat just today. And then today turns into tomorrow. And then pretty soon I'm having to reflect back on it. Okay. I was doing so good back then. What did I forget? What am I not doing now? 
It's so good. And I, and I think we do deserve to cheat a little bit here and there. And I, I believe in everything in moderation, but you're right, is once we unlearn a habit, because habits are so hard to form anyway, that once they're there, we don't want to, we don't want to loosen those ties too much. And I do want to talk about awe for just a moment. I am a huge fan of finding moments of awe, stopping and recognizing them and congratulating yourself for finding them and spending whatever time you need to take it in. Those reflections and memories of those moments of awe get me through some of the hardest days. I'm looking forward to seeing a sunset at the beach again type of thing. I'm looking forward to having another moment out of awe with my loved ones. Whatever it is, I find that those are the memories that can get me through the rough spots. And there's a biological correlate with that. When people experience awe, there's actually this wonderful biological thing that happens too. We release our endorphins. And so it ends up that's LGs and it kills our pain. There's that feeling of connectiveness, a feeling of, of greatness, something grander than ourselves. It's so powerful. And I think that sometimes we fail to experience them and we fail to seek on. So I, and with the very last strategies in the book is called like planning an holiday. Oh, I love that holiday. <laughs> I'm telling yeah. my family that. <laughs> and what that means is to think about things that have just made you in awe in the past. And it could be an incredible sunset. It could be a, a beautiful piece of music that you love, art. It could be acts of kindness, uh, observing incredible acts of kindness of people volunteering, wh whatever it is. And thinking, I'm just going to put myself in the position where I can experience it. <laughs> because if you're in your house on your sofa, and yes, you feel bad, but some days you do feel a little bit better. And can you put yourself in a position where something grand can be experienced? And to think that's as simple as is getting up a little early and watching the sunrise, which knocks my socks off every day. And that is such a ridiculously amazing thing to watch the sun come up. It does it every day, but it's phenomenal. Do I see it every day? No. Again, it's putting yourself in these positions where something magical can happen. Going to concerts does it for you or going to see a ballet or dance and that's what does it for you. And it, it gives us something to get us moving again. One of the most important things that we know for chronic pain is that people need to do things that they value and love. And we know that when people have illnesses like autoimmune illnesses and, and chronic pain that often, especially early in the illness, they give up everything that's fun and enjoyable in favor of doing things you have to do. You, you have a limited amount of energy, and so you're going to work, pay the bills. And at the end of the day, there's just no steam left to do the things that you love and want to do. We now know the importance of actually scheduling these things. So you know what? That appointment for the doctors, after that, we're done with that. We're going to put an appointment for fun. And I'm going to spend the afternoon with my two best girlfriends and we're going to go and have a really nice lazy lunch. So scheduling in as if it's just as important as a doctor's appointment, time that we do to have fun and do happy things. If you can add in something that might give you awe, if it's going to the museum with your best friend or whatever, that can also to check two boxes. It's got you moving three boxes doing something pleasant that's going to elevate your mood a little bit and maybe putting in a position where you can have that incredible feeling of awe. And like you say, Sharon, put that aside because those are the moments, those beautiful, amazing moments that carry us to almost everything. And it's really what counts at the end of days, right? These remarkable experiences with the people that we love. Absolutely. And there's no harm in telling your friends and family what those are. So sometimes I've been in a, a sad place, a sad sack place or whatever. Here and, and someone will just call me up. They we're gonna do this or we're gonna do that. I mean, it's amazing to me. Sometimes I've had to say, "Oh, can we alter it a little bit or whatever?" But even just having someone come by and t remind you of moments of awe sometimes inspired me to be able to find the energy to go share it in some way, shape, or form. So I say, enlist your friends and family in your moments of awe. Let them know what your favorite ones are. Yeah. I love it. And, and it's like, how do we use these incredible tools and skills to build a plan so that we get to where we want to be? And I think that was a whole gist of what I wanted to do. We in academia spend a lot of time with a lot of money to do research and we discover and come up with things and understand things that are actually helpful for people who have illnesses and pain. And much of this doesn't get to them. And so true also the field of positive psychology that we learn, we know so much about it. And again, it often isn't translated 
in a way that people can actually pick up a book and put together a, a program that will make them have a life that feels infinitely more possible. The possibilities are there with less pain and, and hopefully a new lease on life. Wow. We're just down to about seven minutes left. And I want you to share with us what I haven't asked. What's <laughs> still up in your mind that I haven't asked? I'd love to know more about a couple of more of your favorite activities for people or whatever comes to your mind. And then be sure and tell us how to get the book and how to find more about you. Will do. So I think I have so many of them. So I think one of my favorite things, and the, the data are the very best for something that we all do for the most part, walking. Walking is probably one of our double secret, most best interventions. And my suggestion is that if your doctor has said, you're okay to walk, you're okay to start a walking program. Oh my gosh, please do this. Get a Fitbit or some such sort of activity tracker, even a pedometer for 10 bucks and see what you walk in a typical day. Maybe so just carry it with you for the first two or three days and then intentionally add 10 steps per day. That's it. And it doesn't mean it has to be outside in the crappy weather or whatever that is. You can do it inside your home. You can go to a mall. But my favorite is outside in nature. And every day, just maybe add 10 more steps. And what we have is just almost a, a multiplying effect of people starting to get a little bit more fitness, of having a better mood, then mood starts to elevate. People start to sleep better. When we get a little bit of exercise, we actually start to sleep better. And we know that exercise is one of the most potent things for remodeling the brain, for actually changing or helping our brain health. So I love walking and walking any which way that makes sense to you. It's like the accessible exercise. The other thing I suggest too is that exercise is great for us. Most of us don't exercise. Why not? Because it's hard and it feels like drudgery and who wants to go to the gym if you're not a gym kind of person what we see and what we know to be healthy and true is that in addition to walking there's so many other things that are exercise dancing if you love dancing yoga if you love yoga tai chi there's beautiful movements in the morning that we see people doing in the park or qigong things that kind of bring you joy doing your activities just in the house with a little bit more vim and vigor or even just parking a little further away in the parking lot so you're walking a little further in. Just ways that we can add more physical activity into our life is really adaptive. And I think one more I want to talk about too is a mistake many people make, especially newly diagnosed with chronic pain or autoimmune disease, is we tend to do too much on the days we feel good and not do anything on the days we feel bad. And that leads us to often a problem where the days we do too much, the next day we feel awful. And then maybe we don't do much of anything for a few days. And the days that we feel bad, we do nothing, which makes us often feel guilty. So the goal is to try and have a steady amount of activity that we do every day. On days we feel great, maybe we do a little bit more. On the days that we feel lousy, we try and do something. And then on the days that we feel our worst, we try to do one thing that makes us happy. Just one thing. And if it's just reaching out to a friend, if it's reading something that you love or, or seeing a movie that, that, that makes you feel warm and happy inside, by doing that one joyful thing on the, even the worst day makes that day not so bad because one good thing happened and ideally you journal and then you go back and look at, at that day and think, that was a bad day, but you know what? I made contact with a distant cousin of mine and now we're friends again. That was not a waste of a day. I've been guilty of that, where wake up feeling like this is not good right now <laughs> and wasting the day. So I'm a big proponent of finding one thing to do the, during the day to change it around. But because in my experience, it's amazing how fast we can change it around. And then I don't feel guilty at the end of the day that I didn't get anything done. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> agree. Agree. And one of the simplest things I've had people on the sofa tell me that they can do is scroll into your texts and go down towards the bottom of people you've not talked to in a long time. And from your position on the sofa, feeling lousy, send three texts to these people that you just maybe haven't talked to in a while that you really love and care about. Send them a picture. Tell them, I'm just thinking about you. And watch the magic happen. Often you'll hear back from them like, oh my gosh, I was just thinking about you too. I'm so happy to hear from you. And so again, that, that reconnection can be the one powerful thing that you did that day. 
Absolutely. And I think it's imperative now since the pandemic, I have lost touch with so many people that I did that a few months ago was just reaching out. Wow, I can't believe three years have passed. I haven't talked to you. And it's been wonderful. People reconnecting. It feels really wonderful. And it's invigorating. And it's nice to catch up with people. Now, we're just about out of time. Tell everybody where to find Chronic Pain Reset and where to find more about you. Right. You can um, learn more about me at aftonhassett.com. There are links to buy the book there. It's on Amazon and Target and BAM and Barnes & Noble. So it's everywhere. But please, please um, reach out and uh, check out the website. We have a podcast now that we're just starting to post. And so some of the most fascinating researchers I work with, I, I, I work in a marvelous environment at the University of Michigan. There's 12 of us that are principal investigators at this research center, and I talk about them in the book and the things that they've helped us understand, the neuroscientists and physicians and physical therapists. And the podcast, I am just interviewing them too, and so getting a sense of them. We'll have to have you on to share, and I'd love to have you to share your story. So oh, That'd be fun. <laughs> yeah, we'll work back. That'd be great. Everyone, that's Dr. Afton Hassett. And as she said, aftonhassett.com. And if the book is called Chronic Pain Reset, 30 Days of Activities, Practices, and Skills to Help You Thrive, I highly recommend it. It's available on all the virtual outlets, and I'm sure it's available in your independent bookstores. Please support your independent bookstores and ask for it if they don't have it. I'm a huge fan of supporting our independent bookstores. And if you're watching this on YouTube and you haven't yet, please subscribe below because it really helps us grow and get our message out about thriving regardless of your diagnosis. Everyone, have a great week. Join me next week for another brand new episode. Enjoy. The information provided on the Autoimmune Hour, Understanding Autoimmune, and Life Interrupted Radio, including the websites understandingautoimmune.com and lifeinterruptedradio.com, plus social media, is for educational purposes only. What you read, hear, and see on the Autoimmune Hour, Understanding Autoimmune, and Life Interrupted Radio, and its websites, and other media outlets is based on experience only. The information should never be used for any legal, diagnostic, or treatment purposes.